And we're going to be talking with Bob Steinkamp and also with Maria Peek. And this is going to be part of the continuing series. Oh, Bill just did it to himself. He's hurt himself on the way into the studio. <laughs> it happens to the, <laughs> to the best of them. And uh, we're going to be talking. We've been doing a weekly segment on autism, and we're going to talk about social coaching tonight. Then we'll be joined by area filmmaker Michael McCallum, who has new projects in the works all the time and who has some great photos that I've just seen done on Facebook. Well, Jessica Cowles, who's just a fantastic local photographer, has a great series of photos of Michael. I don't she know if you've seen no, Does she do professional work? Oh, yeah. She? yeah. She's got a studio. She's just great. A little studio out in Diamonddale, I believe. Yeah, right next to a recording studio. So she's quite exceptional. So tell me, Bill, what is new coming up? Notable books? Notable books on Saturday. Once a year, uh, the 20 best books of Michigan are honored. And this Saturday at 5.30 at the State Library, that event is held. There's usually about 15 out of the 20 authors come. Uh, there is a price tag to it, so check that. You can check that online at the, uh, the, uh, the uh, librarymichigan.org. Or no, dot, uh, dot mi. Dot, uh, dot oh, really? Gov dot, yeah, it, that's right. It's a state. Mi.us? Yep. No, mi.gov. Oh, mi.gov. Yeah. Oh, um, there, there usually is some uh, exciting things uh, that happen. Uh, this year, Steve Hamilton is the keynoter. He is a mystery That's writer cool. who is extremely popular, both across the United States, and, but especially in Michigan because he writes primarily about Sault Ste. Marie detective. Yeah. Steve has won two Edgar Awards, which is right at phenomenal. the top. Yeah, it's phenomenal. He's won for the best first novel and then best novel. When you think about it, we've got a lot of great mystery writers coming to Michigan. Yes, we have. Elmore Leonard. Yeah. And Robert exactly. Travers. Robert, yeah. yeah. I mean, just really exceptional. Lauren yeah. Esselman. Yeah, they said they, they do more than just... Uh, Must be the long jump. winners. That's <laughs> what <laughs> I'm not quite sure. But. So what else is coming up that we need to know about? I think that's the high point for that's me. That's yeah. the high point. But we yeah. do have some events coming up that we should talk With about the historical right away. Society. With the Historical Society. There's two of them coming up, I believe. Is that right, Valerie? We have on Wednesday the last of our brown bag lunch series which is meets at 1210 at Lansing City Hall. The program this week is Joe Kriego Hacker, who is the daughter of Mayor Kriego, who was in office for 17 years. He's Lansing's longest serving mayor. And what year was that? Uh, he was elected in 43 oh, yeah. and stayed in um, through 60, and was just barely into 61. So he really led Lansing through the post-war boom and really had a huge impact on the look of downtown. Oh. Uh, he was the mayor who decided to build the new Lansing City Hall, for better or for worse. The one that nobody wants anymore? Yes. <laughs> he tore down the old historic one that now the mayor says he would prefer to have. <laughs> See? It's a gorgeous building. <laughs> it was. He also built the Lansing Civic Center, which was a place that I think everybody ended up on a regular basis. Also had also, a reputation as a sort of white elephant, didn't it? And also torn down. Yeah, and also yes, torn down. By a subsequent mayor. <laughs> yeah. That's all mayors do, isn't it? They just put things up and tear them down, I mean, yeah. pretty much. That seems to be what Americans do I guess. in general. Creative destruction, we like to think of it. Yes. So she's going to come and talk a little bit about what her father was like at home when he left the office and left the spotlight. What was he like as an individual person? And how did his time in the mayor's office really um, impact his family? Was he a good guy or did he kick the cat? He was pretty popular. Oh, cool. um, he, I don't think I've ever heard any no. news stories. And at the time, cities were tearing down things and building fresh. Urban and renewal. Especially in the Midwest. That was part of our culture. It's an interesting uh, speculation. I was just reading about um, pulling out some of the super highway extensions that have gone into cities and how that tends to revitalize areas. I was wondering what would happen if you pulled out 496. Hmm. Would it be good we, news or bad news? It'd be a lot of griping. Now, you know, Ann Arbor doesn't have a cross city expressway. No, they don't. And it's a different town because of that. I think so, too. I, I think would say, just everybody close their ears, but I'd say for the better. Lots more local shops. Not as easy to shops. get around, but it's, the downtown is vibrant. Yeah. And we're such an easily, I mean, I think City Post did an article years ago about how commutable Lansing was. You can get from one side of the city on surface streets in about 10 minutes. It's really an easy map. Easy to navigate cities. So, hmm. If we do that, can we please rebuild the old the old home that they tore down to build uh, 496? So, yeah, we, <laughs> there were plenty of them that it's were gone. It's a beautiful neighborhood. Yeah. 
What else is coming up then? Is it you're, the, Are we getting ready for Maiden Lansing? Uh, we are. Our Maiden Lansing exhibit is going to open May 30th, God willing. Ah, um, we, lots of last minute goodies coming in? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Actually had a couple more things confirmed today, so we're very excited about that. Our current exhibit, Lansing Votes, will close April 30th. Okay. which means May 1st we'll all be in City Hall tearing it apart and boxing it up. And then we have a month to build our new exhibit, which will be open for be a tourist in your own town on May 31st. Ah. This exhibit is going to look at about 100 different products that have been produced in Lansing over the years, including pocket protectors. Yes. That were actually invented by someone from Lansing. And who got scammed as a result and didn't make his fortune, apparently. Unfortunately, that's the way a lot of these things go. I guess so. Just being first isn't enough. They came out of Japan after that. Oh, yeah. Makes a difference. There was actually a guy from Lansing who is said to have been neck and neck with Bell for inventing a telephone, oh, but didn't wow. file his patents fast enough. So there's some near misses. There's yeah. also some rather interesting pieces and parts to things. Uh, we came up with a couple wooden wheels from the old Pruden uh, works. These with, are wooden with wheels rims. with steel rims oh. that would have actually they made cars. They made wheels for early cars that were produced in Lansing back when a lot of the car body was wood. The ride was exciting in those wheels <laughs> before the invention it's of the rubber tire. Feels now. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just sort of like all GM cars apparently. Mm, <laughs> um, pickles. We produced all sorts of patent medicines in Lansing. Ah. So, you know, they'll cure everything, sometimes they all with the sure same bottle. Will, because they usually had either cocaine or or uh, opium. 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 And a lot of alcohol. And a very high alcohol content. Yeah. Yes, they did. We are also looking for some items. For example, at one point in time, Lansing was a huge producer of mittens. If anyone has an old pair mittens. of mittens, we would love I think love I remember those. that from somewhere. They come from a Lansing mill. Huh. We're also going to be Do showing... We, and we've not been able to find any originals from there. No. Okay. Unfortunately, a lot of these products were used up and thrown oh, out. Yeah. Mittens, wheelbarrows. Um, these are not the sort of thing that we put under glass and have sitting on grandmother's parlor table. Okay. They're ordinary, everyday objects that we use and use and use and use and use and then throw away the bits and buy a new pair. Yeah. Well, yeah. Wheel, wheelbarrows, especially. They're made out of wood. <coughs> People would put those wheelbarrows 20 years ago in their front yard with flowers in them. Oh, yes. I had the wagon wheel in the, in the ground. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. And then when we had to move it to let a tree trimmer come in, you know, then it means that you find out there's only half a wagon wheel. <laughs> yeah. So what are some of the surprises you found? Any items you didn't know? Well, there were a lot of items that were made by the auto industry but weren't really autos. We're working with the Ariel's Transportation Museum on this as well. And we're going to have a part of the exhibit there. And we're going to be talking about things like lawnmowers and refrigerators Ooh. that were made by the local auto companies. Uh, some of them never went into huge scale production. There was a tractor, for example, at one point in time, which never quite made it off the ground. But these were other attempts to break into other markets besides the snowblowers. Snow There's one item you may want to think of. Uh, oh, my friend of the late uh, Brian, uh, what was it? No, his granddad's name was Roscoe. His name was Brian Heffern. Well, it's not Brian Heffern from Elvertly, it's another Brian Heffern. And um, his grandfather, Roscoe, invented the traffic light. He worked for the Michigan Department of Transportation when it was put together, and when it was time, then all of a sudden the roads were getting so congested they had to do something. And he realized later that, I mean, designers really do have life and death control because he picked red, green, and blue, which is not a good color combination for red, green, uh, colorblind males. <laughs> you have to look by placement. You can't look by color. And he said if he had it to do over again, Roscoe said he would never have done it that way because those were definitely the wrong colors to pick. Interesting. So maybe we can get a traffic light in there. Is he's with the he was with the Department of Transportation. Yeah, Michigan invented yeah, he invented the traffic light there. Which yeah. I think is really kind of cool. That is. Yeah. You know, part of the idea of the exhibit, I think, is Ms. Valley to, to show invention, innovation. Right. And right. right up to contemporary times. Because when a lot of people think of Lansing as being a factory city, they just think of the people working the line producing the items. But somebody had to have that aha moment to see a need, to be able to design a product that would meet that need, to then get the financing for it, yeah. to be able to put together a workforce 
to get the proper machinery. There's a lot of steps to how to make a product that's going to sell, that's going to make a profit. Even investors. Lansing had a significant group of men who were investing in each other's businesses. Mm. And there was a lot of a lot of support for that in the right circles at a certain time. But how do you put all these different ingredients together? It's difficult. I mean, look at the number of new business startups that fail every year. It's a huge number. Well, Bill was in charge of trying to establish an, an entrepreneurial culture here in the state of Michigan years ago, and he was a a state person and uh, one of the things he discovered is that once the automobile industry became standardized and routinized that whole sort of entrepreneurial spirit kind of got put on a shelf yeah we were great tinkerers especially in the development and you'll see that in this exhibit yeah because it developed in lansing as a part of the tinkerers yeah well you know i mean the Wright brothers were what bicycle makers i mm -hmm. mean it's the people who were who were tinkering in the garage with something who came up right. with new items all the time so maybe people can still call or email you if they have oh, items absolutely. that you might not have run across We're yet. We're on Facebook. Um, you can drop us a note there, certainly. You can also email us, info at lansinghistory.org. We would love suggestions. We also love to know what kinds of items people may have in their closets that they'd be willing to pull out and loan for the exhibit. The exhibit will be up at Lansing City Hall starting May 31st. It'll be up through the end of October. And we're also going to be doing a series of programs with that once oh, great. it gets up and into place. Great. So um, how recent are some of the items? Some of them are currently being produced. Oh, still, we want still being to, produced. We want to look at how invention and innovation continues to develop in the city. So, for example, we are going to have some artificial joints that will be on display that are being made in Lansing. Not the cannabis type, but... <laughs> <laughs> Another new industry? Another industry. How about that? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, we're, I, just today, I spoke with the folks out at um, Loran Oils. That's a company oh, yes. that's been in, in... I actually toured there. Oh, really? Yeah, it's that's fascinating. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're a business that's been together for over 50 years. And we're also going for a, a few, you know, a modern version of something produced historically. For example, furniture stores used to produce both furniture and caskets. Uh, it was the Estes Furniture Store that gave birth to Estes, Estes Ledley, Ledley Funeral Homes because mm -hmm. there was much more of a market for funeral homes as the 20th century developed and our burial customs changed and our homes changed and such. There were lots of furniture stores, so they moved into that. We'll try finding a 100-year-old casket. I have tried. I think they're buried. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I can point you to a few up at Luke Cemetery next to my house. They, you know, you'd have to bring them back, I think. But. That might be slightly <laughs> illegal. So we have actually gotten in touch with uh, an Amish woodcarver who oh, makes yeah. old-style caskets, yeah. which today are popular again because it's part of the green burial movement. Sure. And so we're going to be showing a modern casket that is an example of what was being produced. Because here's the thing. We tend to think of history as simply being old dusty things that we inherited from grandma but we are making objects that are today's history tomorrow's right. history and we are still producing some of the same forms that humans have been making for centuries and this casket's a perfect example once we decided we were going to put ourselves in wooden boxes to be stuck in the ground the form hasn't really changed well they had much. an exciting burial up at lake cemetery one time when the bottom fell out of the casket and we found out it was stuffed with pantyhose and newspapers Ooh, yeah, so it, they were buying one of the more, the less expensive caskets. maybe yes. not yeah maybe but not. they were making it less expensive so that way if they were not filling it mm -hmm, no. so for example by um i'm uh, donating a computer that was made for uh, my wife in 19 91. Altair? No, it was ACD. ACD, oh, from ACD net? Yeah. One of the handmade the ones? The two from young guys at that oh. time were just out of high school. Maybe, yeah. And that's how they started making computers. Yeah. I, I, I was looking at some of the specs. People will get a great hoot on it. I'll bet. And they weren't cheap. Oh, no. Mm. No, that's getting one of those. I saw um, a computer that uh, my spouse purchased from IBM. It may have had a monitor. It was $13,000. Yeah, you. I, I, I said you could buy a car that year for that much. Oh seven, yeah, easily. Like I think it was seventy nine. Wow. Yeah, I got by with a little Tandy laptop, a little Radio Shack Tandy for many many years. I had a, um, a lots of an old Sanyo with the double disc drive, the big five and a half inch. If I kept those, you could. Well, I guess they weren't made in Lansing, but they were. They certainly were. And this was and this was place. assembled in Lansing because uh, they didn't make things like that. Here. Well, we don't want to forget. It's Wednesday. 
for the brown wednesday May. yep and then we also have yet another event ah, oops. on may 6th we are going to be doing our annual spring museum fundraiser and we are being hosted this year by president and mrs knight here on the campus of lcc oh, at the herman house yes the which herman house is event. a home that was built with dollars that were made in lansing um, yeah. the family came to lansing in the 1870s John Herman was a German immigrant. Family stories go that he was fleeing conscription in Eastern Europe. The German Empire was just sort of finally becoming Germany as we know it today. And he came to Lansing upon the advice of a friend who told him Lansing was a great city because it was big enough to support business, but it was small enough that you could stand on your back porch and shoot a deer for dinner oh, yeah. if you wanted to. Which I can do again. <laughs> So he packed up, came to Lansing. His family joined him a couple years later, and he started a very, very successful tailoring business. John Herman and Sons originally became John Herman's Sons when he passed away that existed for almost 100 years. Wow. They closed in the 1960s. They made bespoke men's suits, so everything was custom done of mm -hmm. really excellent fabrics. They imported most of their wool from England, from the textile mills there. And it was really a part of downtown Lansing. What for will a long be the time. activities in the evening? We are going to be doing a tour of the house. Okay. We will be talking about the history of the house. We have some wonderful stories about you know different hijinks that was happening in the house over the years and how it evolved. It was in the same family from 1893 when it was built until uh, the 1960s, actually, when it was sold to Lansing Community College. So we have three generations of Hermans who lived there. We will also be going next door to the Rogers Carrier House, which is uh, a moon house, um, one of the really the, the best houses today that survives downtown, both of these are. And we are going to have an exhibit in the Carrier House about the Herman family. Oh, cool. We'll have a Herman suit on display that'll be on loan from Michigan State University's museum. We have some furniture that the family donated to LCC with the house. And we're also going to have an exhibit and talk a little bit about John Herman, the author, who was the grandson of the initial uh, business founder. Uh, John Herman, the author, was certainly not a businessman, per se. He was the family rebel. Mm. He left Lansing in the 1920s as a young man. He was born in 1900. And he found his way eventually to Paris, where yeah. he met a young writer named Ernest Hemingway, who was having a few drinks and uh, penning some lines. They became friends. They would stay in touch for years after. John, however, was not quite as successful as Hemingway. Well, apparently. <laughs> his writing was a bit more salacious, I yeah. think is the proper term. And mm. his first book was published in Paris and never quite made it into mm. the U.S. It was burned at, at the, the border mm -hmm. because it was a little too scandalous to get past the censors. Mm. So John decided to keep going. He wrote lots of short stories, a couple more books. Eventually, though, he ended up in the 1930s, he and his wife, in 1930, actually went to the Soviet Union oh. for a writer's conference. And he got very, very interested in left-wing politics to the extent that while he was working in the FDR administration, there are allegations that he was involved um, in some spy scandals with mm. the Soviet Union. If you've ever heard of Elder Hiss oh, and yeah. Edgar Chambers, yeah. according to John's second wife, John was the man who introduced those two to one another. Excellent. Well, that's going to make some good stories that evening. What night is that? It is May 6th at, at Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock at the Herman House. It is a ticketed event. Tickets are available at our website, lansinghistory.org, or will also be available at the door. Sounds wonderful. It'll Thank you very It'll much. Be That'll be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to shift gears now, and I'm going to introduce and move the camera and introduce... Bob Steinkamp, and he is with a group called Aspire, and it has two P's in that Aspire, and so you're going to tell me what Aspire stands for with the double P. Yes, I am. It stands for Autism Spectrum Partners, providing instruction, recreation, and enrichment. Oh, that's cool. Instruction, education, instruction, recreation, recreation, and enrichment. And, uh, recreation and enrichment. And we're also joined by Maria Peek. And Maria, are you with the same organization, or do you have another acronym I'm going to have to learn? No, I am with the same organization. <laughs> same for the evening. Good. I might ask you two to move a little closer together. We are live webcasting. For those of you, this is WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. This is LCC Radio. You can also see our webcast on our website, Lansing Online News. And um, there, now our webcam is working, and we've got both of you in the... In the webcam. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about, oh, this is autism social coaching. 
And I'm not familiar with the term social coaching. Bob, can you tell me what that means? Sure. Um, you'll know. Hmm. Let me <laughs> start with a little history. Yeah, I could do that. Uh, actually, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, autism and, and Asperger syndrome. Um, one of the major components of of those two, uh, which Asperger's is part of autism, yeah, um, is the whole social deficit. There's many, many social challenges for these people. Um, we come across um, some of the folks we work with, very, very bright people, but have a great difficulty getting on with society and, and relationships. And so the social coaching provides that missing piece uh, to their life and provides the, the social instruction that they need to help them kind of balance out their lives. So do you help the parents of children learn how to coach their children, or do you do coaching sessions with people? What kind of services does your group provide? Well, we, we work primarily with adults. Um, there are many services available for children. Oh. Um, there's um, you know, early intervention programs, and we have a wonderful autism clinic uh, at MSU, an autism lab. And uh, through school systems, there, there are services available. But when uh, young people leave school um, with autism or Asperger's syndrome, they, they have a tendency to get lost. Oh. Could you give us a practical example of a specific characteristic that you try to coach through? Or? Probably the two largest areas that we work with would be relationships with other people and stress and anxiety. These are huge areas. Do you want to add anything to that, Mary? Oh, no, I would have to agree with that. You know, we work with um, young, young adults primarily that um, have very limited social interactions. So often we'll get calls from parents because they have a child that's basically spending the majority of their time in the basement in front of a television playing video games. And um, realizing that that is not a fulfilling life, and so and, and many times that's what Depends they want. The yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 that trap too. Oh. I gave up part of my life to legend of Zelda. Candy Crush kills me too, <laughs> but uh, but they they do want to be active members in their communities, mm -hmm. um, have social interactions, um, but stepping out of that safety net is very difficult. So um, we have developed programs and groups so that we can help support them as they make those steps forward. Were there generations that were lost? In other words, are there people in their 50s, 60s now mm -hmm. who were never diagnosed? I mean, we, our knowledge of this, of, the, of this spectrum is fairly recent. Mm -hmm. And so are those people that you also work with, too, who didn't have the benefit of the group? does a little bit with that. Yeah. yeah. Our, our age limit is uh, 18 to 35. Oh. Okay. But we do get calls um, from, from folks that um, continue to have issues who are diagnosed late in life. Um, we have folks that, that we worked with that didn't get their diagnosis until their mid-20s, later mm -hmm. 20s. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And... Uh, you know, when they when they get that diagnosis, it's it's kind of like, oh, okay. Now uh, I understand. Who now I, I yeah, now, now I get, get it. Um, you mm -hmm. know, and it's it's really a big relief for a lot of them because they can kind of put a name on it. Oh yeah, you know? because um, at least now you can read up on it and you can right. find out what to do. A lot of resources. A lot of resources available. Right. right. Well, I think I recall reading uh, maybe an article in the New York Times about a young couple who were dating and each had different characteristics of autism. One liked to be touched and one didn't like to be touched. Mm. So it made dating a very difficult. They one, were very candid about it. It was kind of. That's weird. one thing with autism. Just because you meet one person with autism does mm. not mean you've only met one person yes, with autism. We heard that. I thought yeah. that was a really good it, way it to explain really it. It really is. Every individual is so different. Um, there are often similarities, um, but how they react in different situations are it's, it's different for every, every individual. So do you do coaching as well, social coaching? I started you there. Started? Yeah. <laughs> I started there. What kinds was, of te te techniques and tactics do you use? How do you help somebody who has the problem? How long does it take to get over certain? Well, the way Aspire runs their social groups is we meet once a week um, for an hour and a half. 
Ah. And so we have small groups, usually between six to eight individuals in the group. We have a facilitator who um, provides the content and the support. We also have um, college students who are volunteers, usually about the same peer age, yeah, that also right. are also there to support. And depending on the level of the group, um, we talk about a concept, and then the next week we may go out into the community and practice that. Oh. So you're there to be able to support them if some anxiety arises, if it's an uncomfortable situation, uh, that you have a couple of uh, adults there to help with that. That So it, it really is, let's talk about a concept, let's um, talk about some potential strategies, let's practice that in a safe environment, and then let's go out into the, the community and practice it in real life situations. Do you deal with things as mundane as eye contact? Oh, or? Or, or how to say hello to people, how to start and end a conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, for some of our individuals, they would not say anything. They would not come into a room and say, and how are you today? I see. Or what did you do this weekend? Uh -huh. Um, but then once you ask them, 45 minutes later, you're still hearing about <laughs> what happened for their weekend. And so it's it's really um, working with them to, okay, what is the body language when you talk too much? <laughs> and yes. Someone's turning away. So let, let's become aware of that so that you know when to stop a conversation. Do you also do things for job coaching along the way? Because I'm assuming that that's part of the challenge. How do you handle yourself in a stressful situation mm -hmm. like a job interview? Well, it's interesting to ask that. We um, we started in 2008 with social coaching. Uh, we actually started here on campus. Oh. Uh, I teach for the college. I teach special education here. And um, that one group now just kept growing and growing. The word kind of got around, and we were getting referrals, and now we get um, – we get input from community mental health and MRS. We still have parents calling us. We have people on the spectrum that call us. So now we have six groups. We have six groups in Lansing. Wow. And it looks like we'll probably have seven or eight by next fall. We work on a semester basis. So there's a spring semester, fall semester, and we have a summer program as well. Um, and once we got into developing this model that has proven to be very successful for these people, we started getting calls from other communities around Michigan saying, Hey, we hear you're doing some cool things in Lansing. Can you show us how to do it? So um, Aspire has been around Michigan. We've trained 10 different sites, different communities on how to create their own social coaching programs. Um, and then from there, we had people contact us about, well, could you use the same ideas in, in training job coaches who are working with these people? And we said yes. And so we have a complete job coaching program, 60-day training that we provide to people around the state. And this is so we're no, doing no that. cost? No, the, there is a cost. For the participants. For the participants okay. also, but it's extremely reasonable as far as um, their semester mm -hmm. um, costs. Some uh, social coaching uh, programs that we've seen in other areas around our state or around the country charge what we do for a whole semester for just one session. Wow. So it, it's extremely reasonable. We also provide them with um, tools to help um, organize themselves and as a reference book. So they, they have a binder that they put materials in. So if they're in a situation when we're not there, Spire's not there to help support, though Bob and I take calls mm -hmm. Mm. all the time, anytime. They have a reference in their binder to go back to to say, oh, this is how I handle that situation. Wow. Do you have things like on YouTube videos they can go back and watch to learn certain behaviors and mirror them? No, but we've thought about that. Oh, <laughs> well, that thinking. would be something that would probably the, be very interesting to learn. Today. Right. Because you could watch it privately mm -hmm. and watch it over and over again and, and coach yourself in right. essence. Yeah. We've worked with a, a woman um, from Canada, Gail Hawkins, who does some pretty phenomenal, phenomenal video work. And we started um, to collaborate with her and she's given us access to some of her videos for job coach training to train the professionals though last yeah. week I went down and Bob went to Canada to see it um, went down and saw her latest video and it's learning to be social and it's r individuals with autism uh -huh. who are the actors and then her next video series that's coming out is on dating because that is a, a huge, huge need huge need and they will 
constantly say, I want to date. But then when you say, okay, I'll set up an environment. Then it's like, no, I'm not ready for that yet. It's got to be, I mean, so, it's scary for people without autism. Without autism. I was thinking about that with, you know, job interviews, mm -hmm. going to college, dating, all of the things that are causing my students who are not on the spectrum to have a lot of meltdowns Anxiety. in the middle of the semester. I can only imagine when you're coping when you may not have those social skills. Then look at things like um, a police officer stopping you. That's the scary you one. You know, those those things that have happened to all of us, how do you handle that situation? We had Scott Schulte on the show last week, and he talked about the training he does mm -hmm. for police mm -hmm. because one of the big concerns is that, I mean, that can escalate into an unfortunate situation right. awful Correct. often. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7, here in Lansing, Michigan. We're talking with Bob Steinkamp and with Maria Peek from Aspire about uh, young people on the Asperger's and autism spectrum and the kind of help that they need integrating into the community. How often, how long do these programs, how many weeks does somebody stay in this program and does that hold them forever or do they need refresher courses? Uh, we run on a standard semester of 16 weeks, and so um, the majority of the folks, um, we have a pick six group, we have about 40 people right now, um, the majority of them come back semester after semester because they see the value. Uh -huh. They see the value in it, and they begin to get connected to other people, um, just like the spectrum, we've heard it as, you know, a, a spectrum. Um, intellectually there's a spectrum socially there's a spectrum okay and so um, we have an application process and from the application process we do a home interview and we do a home interview because what is the most comfortable place for a person to be interviewed it would be in their own home with people that care about them so we do a home interview and from that home interview we decide Maria and I decide which of the we have three levels of groups, so we have some folks that are really, you know, the, the, the young person. This usually it's a male, um, and much more. It's a highly male-dominated disability. So we're seeing more females. We're beginning to see so. more females, mm. but um, present much, no, much more much differently different. than the males. So are the groups gendered? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. We do mix them. No, but we, we have talked up. about, you know, maybe having an all-female yeah. group in yeah. particular. Right. So um, out of the, the, the three levels, then we want, just like all of us, we'd rather be able to converse with, with people that have similar interests. And so um, we put them in groups where we feel that they can get that little head start on trying to on talk to each other. And their Asperger's or their autism is their, really their common bond to each other. Do they, does it work where they have almost a coach or sponsor within the group? Do they pair up and help each other? Uh, some of the activities that we provide during um, a session might warrant some uh, team building type activities or where they're working on a skill together. Um, but we do, I think, take great care in looking at the individuals that want to be a part of Aspire and try to match them so that they um, will feel feel comfortable and hopefully develop long relationships and friendships so that they can um, schedule activities outside of group time. Maria, we, uh, um, how did you get involved in this endeavor? We heard. How did I get involved in this endeavor? Yeah, what, what, well, what, what drew you to it? Um, I was for, interested in the, yeah. back, the backstory. Um, I well, Bob was in special ed. I was also in special ed. Okay. I um, worked uh, in Eaton County as a special ed teacher and then a transition coordinator for many, many years. And um, there were some people in my county that were working at Aspire, and I thought that sounds like kind of fun. Yeah. So I sent in a resume and got hired that day. And hey, the rest is history. Bob and I spent quite a bit of time together. But but yeah, it, it, to me this is. Um, uh, there's a there's a freedom with Aspire. We're not bound to all the rules and regulations of an educational system. Okay. We have the freedom to really address and talk about um, things that are so important to these young adults, and and we're not you know we don't have the constraints of a system or an education. Um, so many fields are actually dominated by people who are somewhere on the spectrum mm -hmm. and they're an advantage because of their hyper-focus mm -hmm. in certain kinds of careers. I was watching Silicon Valley on, 
uh, HBO right. last night, and it was quite funny because the one man who had a son on the spectrum insisted that the guy working at the startup company was on the spectrum as well. I kept saying, not me. No, no, no. no. Right. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> well, and, and I think that's what's so important about something like this today is that, um, you know, there are employers out there that are looking for qualified yes. um, individuals to hire. You could not hire a more dedicated or, or knowledgeable individual, and we need to start to break down those stereotypes and start to educate the community on how to um, interact. You need to start coaching the, the, the people employers who run the job that, environment. Yeah. Well, we've and started, we are starting that. Yeah, yeah, started I've doing started that. doing that. Um, we were actually contacted um, by a, there's an organization in Royal Oak called the Judson Center, which is a large rehab organization in southeast Michigan. And um, they were contacted by DTE, and they wanted to hire two interns with Asperger syndrome. And my applaud DTE. I think it's amazing that they are willing to step up. It, it's usually the other way around, where you have rehab organizations out banging on every door. Right, possibly, trying to get right. Trying to get a job. Yeah. And so um, we provided the we provide the training to DTE. We we give them an overview of Asperger syndrome. These are some things you're going to see. But like Maria said, when you meet a person with autism, you meet a person with autism. And so we we assess and evaluate the person they're going to get. And we're going to say, okay, these are some things that you're going to see. This is how we're going to do it. And we're going to have a job coach with them. But eventually, the job coach is going to fade, and the people within the company are going to... And it's really about up. educating the employers and the coworkers on what some of those strategies are. Yeah. So if something does happen, that you have that visual tool to be able to say... This is your next step, or you know uh, a strategy if they're um, starting to have some anxiety. What is the best way to reduce that and, and to educate those coworkers so that they can continue to provide support? One last question: um, How did you learn what to coach? What the proper coaching techniques were? The answers to how do you change the behavior? How do you reduce the stress? Or does it come from scholarly research? Does it come from Bob working knows with the community? Everybody in the autism field. <laughs> Everybody, he, he knows, he, and he's not afraid to call. He reads avidly. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah. Uh, well, my background is special ed. I was in it for 36 years, and I work primarily with adults, mm -hmm. just like uh, Maria did. Mm -hmm. And when I retired in 2006, we were just beginning to see the tip of the iceberg with the autism yeah. with adults. And I began to hear stories from my colleagues saying, Gosh, these, these they're, we're losing them. They're, they're, they're falling between they're, the cracks. They're falling between the cracks. Mm -hmm. They're graduating from high school and psh, they're gone. And so that was kind of one of the main reasons that we decided to aspire. So um, we learned have, along the way. We yeah. learned along the way, and they they teach us. We oh. learn amazing things from our people. That's Great. what's so amazing about Aspire. It's that um, relationship that you as a facilitator and as a volunteer build with your group and um, they become so comfortable that they truly do educate us about what um, autism is, how it feels, um, what it was like um, in elementary school, middle school, um, when they what, what it was like when they realized what their diagnosis was and what that means. For those who families and individuals who want more information, I'm assuming it's ASPPIRE.org? No. No. It's uh, ASPPIRE of Mid Michigan. Of Mid Michigan. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Okay. <laughs> You're so close. We are not We're very close. Yeah. I give you kudos for that. Yeah. <laughs> but is that the best place for people to get yeah. information? Because I, I, this is tremendous. Yeah. There's photos so they can see some of the activities that we have um, participated in. Um, one more thing, because I think we need to also mention we have a social club. Oh. So all of our groups can, um, the YMCA right down here oh, in great. Lansing on Washington has given us a room that we utilize on Friday nights for two hours. So our groups um, can all come together, and we play board games most of the time. Oh. And it's just a great way to bring everybody together and, and have a little social interaction. I think it's been a remarkable series. You start, at least for me, I've learned so much about autism. I had no idea. I am delighted to see how much is going on uh, right here in mid-Michigan. I mean, we really are sort of at the epicenter of everything happening in the state. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you'll be back and tell us more. 
Thank well, you thank very much. Thank you very much. A-S-P-P-I-R-E of MidMichigan.com. Yes, you. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Now we're going to be joined by filmmaker Michael McCallum, and I'm going to get my station ID out of the way, so when I start talking with him, I'll have it done early. <laughs> <laughs> this is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. And what is what are you brought along with you here? We'll show it to the webcam. I brought some goodies. What is that? This is uh, the next show that, that I'm going to be doing uh, with, you know, my company, Rebel Pictures. It's down at NBC. Um, NBC May is the brewing company? Yep, Midtown Brewing Company, right on Washington Avenue. And um, this is going to be Graham Lindsay, who's a wonderful national touring artist. Uh, he's going to be releasing a new album of unreleased material called Digging Up Birds. Uh, and Graham um, is somebody who I incorporated some of his songs in my first feature film, oh, Fairview Street. Yeah. So then, you know, both of us kind of had um, uh, kind of a tough, tough year last year. We both lost a couple friends and uh, I proceeded to, well, let's let's do something creative uh, right during the terrible ice storm. So. I had a brilliant idea of, let's do a, a music video for you, Graham. Um, I, when we're filming, I was like, whose idea was it to film? Oh, wait, that was mine. Uh, <laughs> that was my idea. Um, Are so you talking literally right in the middle of the ice We storm? were right in the middle of the ice storm. I mean, <laughs> so, uh, beautiful, some, though. Some awesome shots. It makes for good video. You it know, does. It, um, film is forever, pain is temporary. So um, <laughs> that's what I kept telling myself in my, my cold appendages. But uh, uh, So we're going to premiere a music video for Graham Lindsay on 31st of May, 8 p.m. at NBC. And then we're also going to have uh, Billy Cook's going to open, Jen Siget's going to play, and we're going to show her music video that's available online, but we're going to show it on a big screen. You've done that. Yeah. That is great. Yeah. Video. Thank you so that much. Is wonderful. Yeah. So. Jen is such a, you two, the collaboration between the two of you, you know, her music on your movies and then you doing the music video for her that's been one of the really great cross fertilizations here in the area i well thank you so much and um yeah she's wonderful anytime i can get anybody to see or hear what she's doing anybody uh, musically that i've collaborated with uh, it's really really important i can put some some eyes and some ears more importantly to that wonderful music is really really important so we're gonna have a great night of entertainment five dollars at the door not allowed to tell us Oh, uh, no, yeah, that's, that's right. That's one. right. Well, we'll just we strike lie. that from we the lie. record. Yes. That is, there There will be, um, you can look up what uh, the details yes. of that online at uh, rebelpictures.net or look us up on Facebook. Uh, Ixnay nice on the anime. <laughs> um, but no, so it's going to be a wonderful night. So yeah, we're really looking forward to that. Getting Graham into town. He's going to be touring nationally. Uh, releasing that album, making the trip all the way up to Lillo Lansing. What for does us. digging up birds refer to? That's a good question. We'll have to ask him. Ah, we don't know that. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's his that's his you know, gig. Man. I don't know a better lyricist than Jen Sigget. I think She's her pretty good. lyrics are what really set her apart. I mean, she we we have we have an extraordinary number of excellent musicians in the state, but boy, Jen's lyrics are just amazing. And she's also got a great voice. Yes. She writes wonderful, yeah. wonderful melodies yeah. as well. So it's it's kind of tough for me. I'm kind of biased to say what I like more about oh, her music, person, but it's yes, <laughs> it, her lyrics are very, very strong, especially um, putting some of her songs in Fairview Street, having that win uh, Best Soundtrack Award at the Beloit International Film Festival in Wisconsin, and then adding some of her music to Buffalo. Yeah, that hasn't come out yet. We're going to be doing a uh, a Kickstarter campaign for that very soon, so keep your eyes and ears open for that. But she has two songs in that as well. Um, which is one thing, and then the movie ends with Sugar High. And then we have the Lincoln County Process, which oh, is the whole kit and caboodle right wow. there with, with uh, Jeff Lewis and Sam Corbin and yeah. Joe Van Acker uh, with Jen. And uh, they play live in the film oh, at okay. Moriarty's Pub. So they're kind of the, the house bar band, if you will, mm -hmm. um, in a wonderful scene Tell with my father. what so. Buffalo is about. Buffalo is um, a drama that was shot entirely in and around this area. It is the first film that I've done that is noted and takes place in Lansing. So the other films are kind of shot in and around the area. Right. Other locations, Grand Rapids, Detroit, Frankenmuth, where, wherever uh, the story fits, but is, is kind of an anywhere town, nondescript locations. But um, uh, Buffalo actually 
was talked about. It takes place in Lansing, and it's about an older cab driver that my father, uh, William C. McCallum, plays wonderfully, uh, who's diagnosed with a terminally ill disease at the beginning of the film. It's kind of the monster in the monster movie. You don't really know what it is, but you can tell it's serious. And uh, he finds out a short period of time later that his ex-wife died in a car accident, and he decides to take his dog, uh, tells his boss he has a fair in Detroit, and makes the road trip to attend her funeral with the hopes of getting reacquainted with his estranged son that he hasn't seen over 30 years. So you do will, I, you do will I hopefully know who cry the estranged the son is? Um, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. He's an uh, actor, a very close friend of mine named uh, Stephen Russell, mm -hmm. who plays that character. I'm not in the movie at all. Mm -hmm. You're just There's directing. Not, just, just directing, yes. Yeah, um, just a small <laughs> thing, right. um, yeah I just I co-wrote the film with my father. and uh, That's another collaboration that you've had over time that has yeah, really yeah. blossomed, hasn't it? It's wonderful. I love working with him. He is... If I would have just met, I tell this to people all the time, if I would have just met him through friends, I would be casting this guy. Yeah. He's just, he's great on camera. He's very natural. He can be funny. I mean, it's really hard to walk that line of being natural, being comedic, being dramatic, and then also just not overdoing anything. So he he's really perfect of, of just allowing himself to be in front of the camera and really live. And that's something you can't just teach people. They either have that knack and you can work on it or uh, it's going to be really difficult to oh, get it though out. Oh, you do a lot of acting coaching and teaching and yeah. I do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, directing essentially is, is, is a form of teaching. I've kind of realized that over the years is uh it's just an unpaid profession sometimes. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, you know, I've done that uh, civic theater in Grand Rapids. I did some uh, co-teaching with another filmmaker in the area there um, and, and did some acting for the camera stuff. And I love it. I love being able to work with people and work with kids. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful experience. I recently was just uh, asked back to the Grand Rapids Film Festival to direct their production workshop. Oh, so good. that's two years in a row. They do a four-day workshop, everything from screenwriting to showing what the editors have cut together in a very short period of time. Those poor, poor volunteers. Um, you know, they have like 10 hours to cut together whatever they can. But we shoot a short film in one day. And uh, it was I was really humbled to be asked back to do that. Um, and worked with a great team, uh, Andrew Tebow, who's a, a wonderful uh, director of photography, uh, photographer here in Lansing. He works with a really good group, uh, the Board of Sound and Light. Um, they've had two short films for the Fortnite competition at the Capital City Film Festival two years in a row that won the Audience Award. So mm -hmm. it can be done here in town. There's good people out well, there. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that this one is focused on Lansing because in the past you were always sort of vague about I mean, it. was it, clearly Midwest and we knew it was Michigan, but you were less interested in place. Has place grabbed you now for this film? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm embracing of, I mean, I'm here. So I'm embracing <laughs> of saying it is here. I'm not trying to make it look like it's, you know, Paris, France, 1930 <laughs> or something. It is Midwest. Michigan and it's 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 Lansing but I think I didn't want to hinder it story wise people here are going to go okay it's Michigan or I recognize these businesses places people um, but I'd rather have the story kind of take you wherever instead of you know I like Alexander Payne's films a lot and he's very open about saying hey this is Nebraska mm -hmm. like I film in I just wanted to kind of let the stories take you wherever. People that know it's here, great. People that don't are watching it in Chicago or San Diego or India have no clue and are hopefully just being taken by the story. What were some of the challenges shooting in Lansing? Some of the scenes? Um, well, with that film especially, you're always fighting a time and, you know, versus budget thing. Our, our budgets, any budget on any film, they wish they had more than they had. Um, even Avengers, I'm sure they were like, man, it'd be great if we had just a little more. Um, yeah, just a little bit would be nice. I, you know, wanted salmon on the bagel today and not just cream cheese. But uh, um, so, yeah, I think it's always time and budget, uh, trying to work around, you know, short schedules. We shot the whole film in a nine day straight shoot. And then we had some pickup days after that and then proceeded uh, a year later to film just a couple bits and pieces, road stuff. So, uh, getting the time with everybody's really, really difficult. Yeah. We don't have the money to pay people tons and tons of money. 
sometimes, if anything. So it, it's finding the people that are truly passionate about doing it and wanting to not only sacrifice their time, but give their talents to something that hopefully is going to be greater than the, the sum of its parts. Was there anything spectacular? Every single day. Well, you know, <laughs> I know from Visually. what Michael has told some of my classes, <laughs> he had a little altercation with the police once when he was shooting because they didn't anticipate you uh, had a little... Thank you for adding when he was shooting. Because that, <laughs> that's that's a different story thing. at a different yes, time, Bonnie. We yes. don't want to bring up my police record uh, right now. Yes. <laughs> no, um, um, yeah, I, you know, uh, filming anytime... Uh, Buffalo was great because... In the past, um, I've worked on projects that things happened where the director was supposed to let the uh, local law enforcement know, didn't, and uh, didn't tell any of us. So that can always be kind of a sticky situation. But I'm I'm very good with my own films of saying, uh, I'm in charge, let me take the bullet for it. So hopefully not literally, but um, you know, being able to say, hey, I'm in charge, let me deal with it, where other people... Uh, would just kind of push that blame off to somebody else if if things got kind of hairy. So, do you have to have a license to shoot uh, films in various places? Certain places, you you always want to be able to get uh, access or a release. I have different release forms that, mm -hmm. if I was filming in here, I'd have somebody in charge sign it. If I was filming at your house, I'd have you just sign it, so I wouldn't be in court later on you saying that I broke in or something. Hopefully, the cities let the cities require you. To Everyone's different. Yeah, I mean, you can different. go, yep, yep. And, and I honestly don't know how it is filming in, in other states because I've only primarily filmed here. I've worked on a couple films out of state, but that was just as a performer. I was so. staying with a friend on the Upper East Side when Jamie Lee Curtis was filming Blue Steel about a block away, and we watched how that production had to work. And the thought of closing down a New York City street for a few days, that's got to be just horrific. Isn't that insane? And it's got to cost the licensure a lot. For the city. I mean, the city wants to promote having films done there, but at the same time, uh, the chaos that it can cause just in the traffic is I mean, enormous. you're just, you're really, it's, it's, it's like a beaver dam, just, you know, so it's uh, a lot of congestion. To a great extent. I think they're pretty much over the fact of like the cachet and the coolness of movies <laughs> being filmed. That's something else why I like doing stuff here because hopefully it still has that. It still has yeah. the feeling of like, man, there's stuff going wow, on here. Cool. You know, look at the lights. And the and the films do they get played? You know, premiered locally. We do uh, for all my films with you know for Rebel Pictures. We do all the feature films at Celebration Cinema in town. Yeah. And then we also, which is, we're aiming to do Buffalo, um, uh, hope and pray once we raise the funds to finish it, uh, knock on wood. And, um, uh, but, you know, the short films, kind of like this showing for Graham Lindsay, is, is more in informal and in, in kind of uh, impromptu venues. It's a place that uh, Mark Wolbert, who's a really good buddy of mine who owns NBC, allowed us to film some of the music video there. Why not give him some of that business back? Absolutely. We're not renting the theater out for two hours for 10 minutes worth of material. We would all like to hang out and have some wonderful food and drinks. So it's kind of a no-brainer. So. That's good, because the more community-based the film is, the more authentic it seems to me. I mean, then it has a real sense of place to it, a real authenticity. For people it. here, and also I think people can get a sense of that outside of the area, too. There's something, there. It's I think it's it feels like it's painting with a certain palette of colors yeah. than that is different. I love New York City. I love Chicago, but there's lots of movies filmed there. There's yeah. very few done here that feel like it's not just... Uh, you know, the drug deal gone bad or something. It can be something that has a real weight to it. This this film is, you know, co-written by myself, 35 years old, with my father about a guy in his late 60s who's kind of only started living once he, he found out he was dying. That's not a story that most yeah. people my age would, would be writing. So What visually, though, did you get excited about shooting here in Lansing? What? Well, there's a lot of things. There's, there's, we filmed a lot for this film in downtown Lansing here. Uh, the car that I drive currently is a, a 79 Malibu. People around town <laughs> see it a lot. Outfitted to look like a cab uh, for the film. My car, um, here's all the, the glam and, and glamour uh, with independent filmmaking. My car broke down, so then now I'm driving the oh. cab. So, um, so now I'm driving that very distinct automobile. But it was cool to film in and around the downtown because except for a couple short films, I haven't really filmed a lot in the downtown area. 
but to watch people light up when they see that car uh, also the interaction with my father every other performer in it and and a lot of it true is, is uh, uh, with my father and the dog in the film who uh, is a uh, does the dog steal the show he, the dog steals the show <laughs> he's <laughs> even very he's very honest <laughs> yeah, it is. With Charlie yeah it is highways. yeah it is with, you know and it's not a, film. It's, it's, a perfect it's, it's not a Disney film it's not a Benji movie yeah. but uh uh, Scooter um, is just a, a wonderful, he, you could not have a trained animal that would act this way on camera. He and my father have a really wonderful relationship. I just love the pictures, Jessica. They're just great. <laughs> and, and the posters, um, the the stills that yeah, are online, um, gorgeous. Jess mentioning her earlier, she's taken some wonderful stills uh, of me and um, you know her studio in uh, JDC <laughs> Photography uh, in Diamonddale. It's on 110 South Bridge Street. Um, does wonderful work, but Kevin Fowler took the 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 stills for the poster. Ah. So he's a, he's another great collaborator that I've worked with. So um, yeah, just honored and blessed to be able to work with some of those folks. Has Kickstarter helped you and other filmmakers have <coughs> access to capital for uh, when you need it? Is it uh, is it turning out to be a good thing? This would be a great question to come back at the end of June. And, and <laughs> <laughs> has the Kickstarter it's campaign so started yet? Not yet. It's Not going yet. to. Probably this evening, and we'll oh. launch it or tomorrow. Wow. So, um, yeah, we're we're needing to raise a for me a significant amount of money, which in uh, on the grand scheme, you know, scheme of things and scale of things, with uh, bigger quote unquote independent Hollywood features, is a drop in the bucket. But it definitely did for the last short short thing. We yeah. would not have been able to finish that film one and premiere it locally at the Waterfront Bar and Grill. Yeah. We had hundreds of people there. It was a great night of entertainment. Uh, DJ uh, McCoy spun some, some awesome records before the show. Uh, we showed the movie, and then from Big Sur, really wonderful local band played afterward. We had uh, Ted Wilson with Michigan Shirtworks there printing shirts on site. They become really unique uh nights of entertainment it's like you want to be there you cir hopefully you circle that night on the calendar and in in red sharpie and you're going to be there you helped make me in michigan a happening place i, I hope mean, so yeah, thank you yeah no, that makes a huge difference well, all these things add up too they do There's a lot of exciting things going yeah. on in lansing yeah I, yeah I, i've heard a lot of people say that lately that i didn't expect it from so when will Buffalo be released? What is your target date? That's we are aiming for the end of the summer, early fall. End of the summer, early um, fall. You know, kind of working around getting the film finished and raising the the rest of the funds for post production, but also um, working around the summer blockbuster movies because Ooh, yeah. they are going to want to hold Transformers Ten over Buffalo, uh, unfortunately. I don't know um, why. I don't. I I agree. Um, but yeah, and we got a lot of other films in the work. To, uh, we just shot a short film called Take a Penny, uh, shot another film a month ago called Two for the Show, and then this next month we're shooting a third short this year already called Confidence of the Tall Man. Uh, that is starring, yeah, that's a lot. starring our, our, our wonderful own uh, local legend, Johnny DeMarco, who works at Paisano. Oh, so great. Uh, he's a, a local talent, and we've talked for years about working together on something. So I love short films, and then they can live forever online in various places as well. Sure. Yeah. I, I just always equate it with, uh, you know, talking about Hemingway earlier, uh, mentioning, hearing that segment is some things are short stories, some are novels, mm -hmm. and not every you know, script is 50 scenes. Right, Sometimes right. It, it's it's you and I playing these characters and it could be 10 scenes. Why stretch it into something that it's not, allow it to be what it is. So we're, we're really excited to be doing that. Well, I will urge everybody, I think the place to go is Rebel Pictures Online and to be able to find out what's happening and keep track of everything. And then it's at the end of May, on the Saturday, May 31st, that the Graham Lindsay, Jen Siget, and Billy Cook show is going to be there. At NBC, at that's going to be an awesome That's going to be a fantastic time. Thank you to Michael McCallum and thank you to our our Maria Peak and Bob Steinberg and also to Valerie Marvin. We'll be back next Monday night <clears throat> with Lansing Online News Radio with Bonnie and Bill. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. We will see you next Monday night at 7 p.m. Thank you very much.